Welcome everyone. I'm Jeunesse Castelgay, VP at Clarius. You're in for an exciting and fast-paced presentation today. We're excited to bring back the dynamic duo, Dr. Soren Boysen and Dr. Serge Shaloub, as they present live, Veterinary POCUS Assessing Acute Abdominal Conditions Using the Rapid Five-Point Abdominal POCUS Exam. First, I'd like to acknowledge the teams at the Vet Show and NAFC for inviting so many of you to join us here today. You're among over 3,500 doctors of veterinary medicine who registered for today's popular educational event. A housekeeping note, you can use the questions box at any time during today's webinar. Our guest experts will answer questions during the live Q&A session following their presentations at the top of the hour. Today's webinar is race approved, thanks to the vet show, so please do stay on for the full session to qualify for one CE CPD credit, which you'll be able to redeem via an email from the vet show in the coming week. In a moment, Drs. Boysen and Chalou will teach us point of care ultrasound essentials for performing the five point abdominal focus exam in under five minutes. They'll showcase pre recorded canine exams to help you hone your ultrasound techniques. Following their presentation, we'll see live scanning with your host. Let me introduce you to him now. Dr. Frankel is trained in emergency medicine in California. A passionate focus educator, Dr. Frankel has been using point of care ultrasound his entire career. He practices in a busy academic teaching hospital in Vancouver as an emergency physician and serves as chairman of our medical advisory board. Dr. Frankel, welcome back. Thanks, Jeanette. It's great to be here today. And to set the stage for today's discussion, we did a bit of a literature review. The first is a review article uh, talking about the utility of cage side ultrasound in the emergency room and in critical care patients in the intensive care unit. And it really highlights how incredibly useful information for real time assessment of fluid and organ abnormalities can be identified with point of care ultrasound, which are often missed or only suspected by physical examination, basic blood, urine testing, and radiography, really providing a significant adjunct to the clinical application uh, in both the ER and the ICU. And in those sickest of sick patients in critical care assessing volume status, ultrasound can really help uh, predict how a patient's going to respond, whether they need or will respond to vo volume or plasma products. And it can be uh, combined with other ultrasound studies to provide highly useful global information in caring for those critically ill patients and what the best management approach would be. And even more pertinent to our webinar today is that one literature review looked specifically at how ultrasound examination has become a key element in the workup of patients with urinary signs because of the ability to easily assess the kidneys and urinary bladder and the ease of assessment in the hands of sonographers. And who better to really further introduce us to these topics and then our honor to bring back Dr. Soren Boysen and Serge Shalhoub from the University of Calgary, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Boysen is a specialist in veterinary emergency and critical care, while Dr. Shalhoub is a specialist of veterinary internal medicine in small animals. They're both recipients of numerous and speaking awards and are considered pioneers in veterinary point of care ultrasound. Having introduced the veterinary profession, to the abdominal sonography exams through original study published in 2004 and having combined a total of over 25 peer reviewed articles and book chapters on the subject. Doctors Boyce and Instagram, I'm gonna hand it promptly over to you. Thank you so much, Aron, and hello everyone. And I'm Serge. And I'm Sir. And we're here today to talk to you about everything nephrology, urology, kidney dialysis. It's gonna be the best show on earth. Dr. Boyce, we're gonna be talking about urine. We're gonna be talking nephrons. Okay, I, I realize you just had an eight-month-old uh, baby that's keeping you up at night, Dr. Schlub, and you've got some sleep deprivation. Uh, oh. We just finished the kidney talks at uh, the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association. Today, we're talking about point-of-care ultrasound. We will right. include a little bit of kidneys, but by far not the most important part of our abdominal or patient assessment. So we're going to talk about the five-point abdominal point-of-care ultrasound exam. And I would just like to point out real quick, in relation to this presentation, we do receive an honorarium from Clarius but we otherwise have no conflicts of interest. So let's go ahead, Dr. Schlub, and go through today's objectives then. 100% Dr. Boysen. So we're going to discuss how point of care ultrasound is applied based on the clinical setting encountered. And that's going to be very important, that clinical setting. Absolutely. And then we're going to review current specific abdominal point of care applications. So what are those questions when we're looking with point of care ultrasound beyond free fluid, which is what we originally started with with the FAST exam? What other questions can we ask and answer with abdominal point of care ultrasound? 100% Dr. Boysen. And then we're going to demonstrate how the five-point abdominal point of care ultrasound is performed. 
And then we're going to use a case to help bring forward and show how we can use and ask and answer some of those questions in a real case. So we're going to use a case to demonstrate the application of point of care ultrasound in a patient that presents with acute abdomen. I love it, Dr. Boysen. Let's go ahead and introduce our case. We have Zola. It's a three-year-old male neutered husky. She was in the back of an F-150, if I'm not recall correctly, Dr. Boysen. Real case here. Jumped out and landed on the tailgate. Ouch, that would probably hurt about 48 hours ago. So this is not immediately, 48 hours ago, she seemed totally fine. Like went home, ate, next day was seem okay, but then vomited and then has not eaten for the last 24 hours and now doesn't want to get up and walk. Ouch, Dr. Boys, and I'm a little worried about that. I would agree, I would be worried as well, Dr. Schlub. And where do we want to go from here? What's one of the first things that we need to do when our patient presents with this type of a presentation? Well, I'm an internist, Dr. Boyson. I'm going to run out of the room and try to find someone that's more competent. All right. So we'll get our students then to do a physical exam. Physical exams are a very important part of our initial assessment. It helps dictate where we're going to go next. So we did do the physical exam, Dr. Shalhoub, while you were off trying to de-stress and uh, relax a little bit, come back into the room. And on All that right. physical exam, we can see that Zola is dull and uh, but responsive. Weight, we're estimating about 30 kilograms, uh, only because Zola was not too uh, amenable to moving. Was ambulatory, ambulatory, but did not want to walk. So we didn't stress Zola. We estimated 30 kilograms. Heart rate, 160. Respiratory, 20. Temperature, 37.1 or 98.8 for our American uh, colleagues online with us. And very painful. Does try to bite when palpating the abdomen. It's a husky, so you got to take that with a grain of salt. Some of those guys can be pretty sensitive. But Dr. Shalhoub, you're back in the room. And our I students done the exam. Well, let well, me ask sir, you a question. Ask me. Is our patient stable or unstable? Well, you taught me, Dr. Boysen, back in the early 2000s, just showing your age to everyone here, you know, the, the grayness and the lack of hair there. Um, if I recall correctly, this patient would be unstable. We're tachycardic. We're hypothermic, Dr. Boysen. I don't like this one bit. All right. Well, at least you paid attention for at least five minutes at that initial uh, graduation you had, Dr. Schlue. You managed to say it's unstable. I 100% agree. Now, here's another entry question. In our unstable patients, what do you think? Is point of care indicated? Point of care ultrasound indicated in this patient? Yes or no? Hmm, that's interesting, Dr. Boysen. I would have to say yes. And that's because we both love point of care ultrasound. I would say it's absolutely indicated. But we're going to have to show this, Dr. Boysen, because you're the one who published the very, very first fast paper back in the 1920s, about mid 1930s, long time ago, okay, 2004. And if I recall, that was for trauma patients. It seems the longer we present together, the older I get, that might be true, but it accelerates when we lecture together, Dr. Schlup. But yes, we did do that original study. And then we followed that up with this paper here, which relates specifically to patients presenting stable or unstable. So I'll let you go through the first part because that's more internal medicine, you know, kind of the boring stuff that doesn't really have any excitement to it. Very stable patients. What are we going to find in those stable patients that should have come through internal medicine instead of circumventing the system and coming through ER, Dr. Schlu? All right, Dr. Poison, you know, I like those stable patients. The prevalence of free fluid in any cavity with point of care ultrasound here. So we're talking about abdomen, we're talking pleural space, we're talking pericardial sac, Dr. Poison. The prevalence of free fluid is dun, 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 on stable patients based on that triage exam, heart rate, lungs, despite you not wanting it, kidneys as well, less than 10% chance of finding free fluid. Now we got to note, Dr. Poison, that's not a negligible amount, less than 10%. So still worth doing on those stable patients. Absolutely it is, because we might find something we didn't anticipate, but this is where it gets really interesting. Let's suppose we look at the most important organs in the body, the heart, the brain, the lungs, not the kidneys, the heart, the brain, and the lungs, and something's unstable. Let's say we're in respiratory distress, we're tachycardic, maybe we've got four pulses. Something tells us our patient's unstable. We then put a probe on that patient. And what we did in this original study, we looked for fluid. We were doing fast exams on the thorax and the abdomen. We looked for free fluid in the pleural space, the pericardial space, and the abdominal space. And what do you think the chances are in an unstable patient? We're going to find something, regardless if it's a cat or dog, if it presents unstable to our ER department, greater than 75% chance we're going to find fluid somewhere in that patient. And this was when we were just doing fast exams and limiting ourselves to just looking for fluid. We go way beyond fluid now. We look for a lot more with our uh, point of care ultrasound than we did with our fast exams. So I'm willing to bet that this number is even higher 
and we will actually find if we start looking for bee lines or lung pathology or gallbladder changes, some of the things we're going to go through today, it will be even higher than this. But the 100%. summary that we can say with these situations, Dr. Schlub, what is our summary? We can say that serious conditions result in sonographically detectable findings, Dr. Boysen. And I think that is very key. Zola, not a hit by car patient, not a classic trauma patient like your paper back in 2004, the very first paper. But again, there's something wrong with Zola. She's unstable. Boom, there is value doing point of care ultrasound. But I got to ask you a question. Should I do all parts of point of care ultrasound all the time? I mean, you know me, if my physical exams. I'm going to do every single thing on every single patient, including a rectal exam. Should I do a rectal exam on Zola? All right. So that brings up an interesting point, Dr. Schlup, because we do like to say that point of care ultrasound is an extension of the physical exam. And if your patient is stable, like most of your patients on the internal medicine service, then absolutely, we got the time to look at a lot of things. But I'll ask you, should we do it exactly the same in every single patient? For example, if our patient comes in with respiratory stress, are we doing a full orthopedic exam? Is that always indicated? Or I don't are we even, in every single patient doing a cranial nerve exam? I don't even know how to do an orthopedic exam, Dr. Boysen, so I think we're in the clear there. All right. So I went on to agree, and just because you brought it up, Dr. Shalhoub, if this patient is presenting down here, it is dysmic, it is trying to die, it is agonal, are you doing a rectal in that uh, patient, Dr. Shalhoub? Come on. Uh, maybe that sounds like a bad idea, Dr. Boysen. All right, so there you go. All aspects of point of care ultrasound, especially given that we're expanding what we can do with point of care ultrasound, are not always indicated in every single patient. You have to apply it based on the clinical setting, Dr. Shalhoub. 100%. Now, Dr. Boysen, though, I got to ask you a question here. So, how do we apply point of care ultrasound, right? Is it, do we memorize certain protocols, count certain ribs, and do all aspects? I know you just said no, or are there very specific indications depending on patient presentation? All right, and we're going to come back to that. It's a very good question. We'll see if we can shed some light on that. So we do assess the patient, and therefore, there are three general applications that we use for point of care ultrasound at this time. And we'll go through the specific questions on the abdominal point of care ultrasound because that's one of the big ones we look at. You can see over to the right here, we got a dog that came in for GI signs and acute abdominal pain. We have the clarius here. This patient's in standing, Dr. Shalhoub. We're going to come back to that. Scan the patient in the position it's most comfortable. You can see that here to the right. We've got the uh, clarius at the umbilical site. We'll come back to that as well with the patient in the standing position. And you can see on the uh, iPad here, we've got a lot of free fluid. So a very useful test. That's our abdominal point of care ultrasound. Other general applications we can use? Well, we got pleural space and lung ultrasound, arguably our favorite. This is so cool. So we can look inside the pleura and also the lung. We can see lots of beelines in that image there, Dr. Boysen, alveolar interstitial syndrome. And that could be yeah. caused by a lot of different things. But look at this beautiful thing here. We see this really quickly. The animal is on the table and we haven't moved it. We're going to come back to that. Absolutely. And then the last application we have, we do have cardiac point of care ultrasound. This is a, a dog that we saw when I was locum at uh, Guelph. And you can see this is a Rottweiler that presented in left lateral recumbency. We pop the probe on over the heart. Cardiac point of care ultrasound is another general application. You can see that I can assess the heart and answer a lot of questions and get information, even with that patient in left lateral recumbency. So cardiac point of care ultrasound is also one we look at. And then Dr. Schlup. Yeah, and then we have other techniques that are being developed as research expands. So using point of care ultrasound for nerve blocks, also looking at the optic nerve sheet diameter, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to potentially talk about some of them today, but it's ever expanding, Dr. Boysen. But I think the key thing is we have to talk about how this is used. Key thing, Dr. Boysen, it has to be patient-centered. That is key, Dr. Boysen. It can't be protocol-centered. We have to start with the patient and think about that patient first. You bet. And this comes down to some of the work from the human literature. You can see those uh, articles here. This is kind of how we've evolved and created that patient-centered targeted approach. doesn't matter if you're doing abdominal, pleural space, and lung or cardiovascular. We still need to look at that patient. It is patient-centered and targeted, and we'll come back to this over and over again. So we got to look at the history, the initial clinical exam findings, other diagnostic tests when that patient first comes in. And then with that patient assessment, we are going to use pretest probabilities to determine what we think there is and what the likelihood of an underlying problem exists so that we can expedite and efficiently manage those patients in terms of treatment and other diagnostics.
I love it, Dr. Boysen. So with Zola, we had it set Zola as unstable. So like we talked about, we're not going to do all parts of point of care ultrasound. We're going to focus it based on what the history and physical exam told us. We knew that Zola wasn't dyspneic or tachypneic. So in this case, we're likely going to start with the abdomen. So that is very important, Dr. Boysen. We're going to do what's called triage point of care ultrasound. We're going to use minimal windows to diagnose quickly what's going on with Zola and then complete whatever complementary exams we need to afterwards. So patient-centered is important. Absolutely. If, for example, a patient comes in in shock, I put my fingers on that pulse as my triage, and I detect pulses paradoxus, my first thought is not, let's do a rectal because I'm, I'm Dr. Shalhoub. My first thought is, let's check that pericardial space because it's pulses paradoxus. Number one differential in that unstable patient in that situation would be pericardial effusion. If I got tamponade, I'm not doing a full thoracic or full abdominal evaluation we need the minimum number of windows to find the problem, stabilize the patient, and reverse the problem. And in that situation, we can then extend once our patient is stable and expand to do more point of care ultrasound evaluation. And there is evidence on the human side. It's not very invasive, but there is some evidence to suggest that point of care ultrasound can, if it's inappropriately applied, delay treatment and adversely affect outcomes in some ER cases. So this is a case where pulses paradox is trying to die we're not going to be doing a full point of care ultrasound evaluation. Minimum windows, find the problem, stabilize the patient. I agree, Dr. Boysen. So when we see the heart break dancing like this, that's not good. I know you could probably do this back in the 80s, but now if you're arthritis, it might be a little hard. But the key thing is at this point, you can also use point of care ultrasound to treat Dr. Boysen, interventional point of care ultrasound here. We saw the pathology. We want to stabilize the animal. It's not just a look-see, Dr. Boysen. We're going to use point of care ultrasound to stabilize. This cat has pleural effusion. We're using point of care ultrasound to remove that pleural effusion and stabilize our cat. And we can actually see this cat starting to breathe better and with less dyspnea. So that is very key, Dr. Boysen. Yeah, and lots of evidence on the human side to show that ultrasound guided techniques have less complications than blind techniques. So the other thing we do then is if we see a problem, this is nice as well, because we can do serial point of care ultrasound to monitor how things change over time. So over on the right here, this is another example of the lungs, but this is applicable in the abdomen. It's applicable with fluid or other abnormalities. If we see a problem, we can treat and see how our patient responds. So in the top image, we see that we've got very white lung. This is fluid in the lung itself, pulmonary edema, secondary to congestive heart failure. We start furosemide, we can see we go from white lung to striped lung, where we got a black and white alternating pattern showing improvement in aeration, decreased fluid in the lung, and then we get to the bottom image down here where we've almost got normal looking lung with only one white vertical line. So this shows us that our therapy is working. We can use point of care ultrasound to track things serially and potentially see that improvement over time. Or if it's not improving, we know we either got the wrong diagnosis, reassess, something's happened, or we need different therapies. 100% Dr. Poison. And then another big facet that I use every day is systemic point of care ultrasound. When you and I are transferred patients from the ICU in the morning, and I'm not quite sure what's going on, you know, they have an ain't doing right kind of presentation. I'm going to do a systemic point of care ultrasound. I'm likely going to do multiple point of care ultrasound exams, combination of abdomen, cardiovascular plus, et cetera, et cetera. And it's going to be so much more information than just the physical exam. It's going to be complementary and additive as well. So this is definitely my favorite part of the morning because I learned so much about my patients. Yeah. And in addition to those transfers that we use our general physical and our overall baseline point of care ultrasound at systemic evaluation, we can also do this pre and post surgery, our more stable patients, make sure there's nothing going wrong before it goes into surgery or get that baseline coming out of surgery. So we know where we are at time zero or those patients that come in an ER, got a bit of GI signs, not doing right. We treat it with uh, sub -key fluids. We monitor it for the day. Before it goes home, we do a general physical exam. It's stable. We can also complement that with point of care ultrasound just to make sure we're not missing something that we can't see. Otherwise, when we're using our point of care ultrasound, we might pick up. So another nice application just before we send it home. I love it, Dr. Boysen. So let's talk about general concepts of point of care ultrasound in terms of probe selection. We tend to use one probe and one probe only, and that is a microconvex curvilinear probe. We use this for all aspects of point of care ultrasound, including the heart, Dr. Boysen. We do play with the frequency, we do play with the depth, and we do play with the gain, but those things are done on the fly. But when it comes to the probe, we use one probe and one probe only, Dr. Boysen. Absolutely, 100% agree. What about clipping? Do you clip or not clip, Dr. Schlup? 
Well, Dr. Boysen and Firebird call the ICU techs ban you from clipping any animal. And I think it's based on your personal haircuts yourself. I think they recognize quickly that things would go very badly for animals. So what we have transitioned to do because of that situation is we just part the fur, Dr. Boysen. There's actually no need to clip the patients. You can certainly clip a window if you needed to, especially on those Nordic breeds with that big, heavy fur. But in an emergency setting, we don't have time. We're just going to part the fur and apply our coupling agent directly on there, Dr. Boys. And it's going to make it a lot easier. You can actually slide the skin also from that point that you have wetted with your coupling agent. And that avoids the need to shave that entire patient, maybe a very angry owner. Absolutely. And you'll see that the images we have uh, today, and I, I believe at the end when we do our demo, we're not going to shave the patient. We're going to show you uh, what quality image we get when we just apply alcohol and separate the fur. So that then brings the next question. We got gel shown here. We got alpha gel shown here. What is the coupling agents of preference that we're going to apply in this situation, Serge? Well, it's going to be alcohol because it's very present in the clinics, right? There's alcohol bottles everywhere, so we can use that really quickly. It provides great, great coupling agent, and that's what we tend to use. You can use a combination of alcohol and gel, and now because of a certain pandemic that's been around for two years, everyone's familiar with these products, Dr. Boyce, and these hand sanitizers. But from what I understand, you'd love to rip off the label and create something of your own here. Yeah, you know, you just take off the label. I'm thinking I uh, don't make enough money as an academic getting paid under the university umbrella. So what we should do is uh, just take that label off, call it Pocus Jalcohol Coupling Agent, and I could become rich off of something that already exists. I see that, Dr. Boysen. That is a very interesting perspective. But let's go ahead and move on and talk about what else we can do. We can actually put alcohol on the dog and gel on the probe. That is fantastic. Personally, for me, when I do the heart, it gives me just that extra, extra, extra coupling agent um, and clarity for me to be able to see for those ultrasound beams to go through. So all those combinations are totally okay. Gel is also totally okay by its own, Dr. Wisdom. There's no problem with that. But again, usually on the emergency floor, alcohol bottles are easier to found for us in the veterinary world. But now let's come back to Zola, Dr. Boysen. So we also did some emergent diagnostics, right? We did some quick assessment diagnostics. And I think I'm a little worried about some of these numbers. You bet. So in addition to being unstable on our physical examination, we can see looking at our minimum emergency database from the blood work standpoint, our pack cell volume is looking okay at the moment. Our total solids are a little on the low side, which can be a concern, particularly given that pack cell volume looks okay. Our urea is very interesting, Dr. Schlup, greater than 80. Now, that's something that I believe comes from or is influenced by the kidneys at times. So an area that you probably got some excitement or interest in, so we'll come back to that, but definitely abnormal. Our glucose is slightly on the high side, probably stress. Lactate's up at 8.3, suggesting we might have some hypoperfusion going on. And to support that hyperperfusion, we also did our systolic Doppler blood pressure. You can see we're sitting at 78 millimeters of mercury. I want that at a minimum of 90, Dr. Shalhoub. I'm more comfortable when it gets over 100. So that's definitely a concern. Now I'm worried we have an unstable, hyperperfused, hypotensive patient that has a massive azotemia potentially. Where are we going to go from here? Well, Dr. Boysen, you definitely piqued my interest. So I am thinking we've got to concentrate on the abdomen here, Dr. Boysen. And again, the key thing is you want to ask the questions before putting the probe on the animal. And we do this in a binary question fashion because it makes life a lot easier and simpler to ask that yes, no, is this present? Yes, no. So Dr. Boysen, I want to think about point of care ultrasound specifically more for the abdomen here. And we got to ask ourselves some questions here, potentially some differentials. But Dr. Boysen, I'm a little worried that there might be a lot of possibilities. Take me through some of the possibilities for an acute abdomen in a dog. Yeah. So again, we don't stop applying the clinical knowledge that we know and that patient-centered approach. Our patient comes in and there's lots of different things we could be looking at. We could be dealing with a hemoabdomen. Maybe we had a mass that ruptured when our dog jumped out of the truck. I'd expect it to be a bit more stable, uh, unstable before now. So that's lower on the list, but still possible. A uroabdomen, that's one that we see with low impact trauma in our dogs that have full bladders, for example, trying to jump out of the truck. So uroabdomen would certainly fit. Bioperitonitis, another trauma that might result in an acute abdomen related to that incident, but I'd expect him to be a little more stable at this point in time. We don't usually see the consequences of that bioperitonitis for a couple more days. We could have referred pain, it is a husky, but again, I wouldn't expect them to be unstable and in a state of shock, we've got referred pain. So maybe we also are dealing with something unrelated to the trauma, the tailgate injury, 
Maybe we have another acute abdominal condition, completely unrelated, GI foreign body, pancreatitis. Maybe we got GI perforation that's causing the signs we're seeing. Or we may have another organ system involved, such as pericardial effusion that's happening in the thorax that could also present in a sudden state of shock. The nice thing is our patient is in a stable respiratory state. So again, in a state that's uh, unstable and in shock, the place that we're going to start, we want to think about that heart and pericardial effusion, but we're going to start with the abdomen because that's where the most number of differentials are and probably the easy place, easiest place for us to assess our patient. 100%, Dr. Boys. And so again, based on these differentials, we've got to concentrate on the abdomen and we've got to think about what patient position. The reality is it doesn't matter. We want that patient to be as comfortable as possible and as stable as possible. So we're going to let that patient dictate what position they want to be in. So I think it's important to go through quickly what sites we assess when it comes to abdominal point of care, ultrasound, we'll short really quickly now, Dr. Boysen, and then concentrate on each site with the specific questions that we have gone into firsthand when we do each site. So All right, so this is really something we can do in about 60 seconds or less. So take us through the different sites, how quickly you can find those, and a general overview of the abdomen and Dr. Shalhoub. 100%, 100%, Dr. Boysen. So again, first site we're going to often concentrate on is going to be the sub foot right at that palpable V. We saw that there. Then we're going to go to the umbilical site, Dr. Boysen. Great site for fine fluid. Yes or no. And then we're going to move on to the bladder site. We're going to spread those legs there to get access to the bladder. There's the bladder there. We're doing everything right now long axis, but we do everything in long and short axis. Then we're going to hit the paralumbars. There's the right paralumbar that we're going to look at right there. Obviously, the most important organs in the body, the kidneys right there. Look how beautiful that is. And then often we're going to let that patient stand or flip it to the other side and go look at the other paralumbar, and that's going to be the left. Phew, Dr. Boysen, I've just completely run out of breath. We really do that in 60 seconds sometimes? So it is, and we do both long and short axis. So we do like to get comfortable looking because we can find different things and assess different problems in short versus long axis. So we do both orientations. That was very quick, but we just wanted to show quickly how rapid in a clinical setting you really can find and assess those five sites. And if our patient's standing, then we don't have to worry about flipping them or rolling them up. We'll look at all five sites in the standing patient. And that is often how we scan our patients these days in the position they're most comfortable. A lot of patients are most comfortable in a standing position, Dr. Shalou. I love it, Dr. Boys. And so if we go to the five-point abdominal point of care ultrasound and we look at what questions we can ask, binary questions, one of the most basic ones, again, that you published in 2004 when it came to trauma patients, was there, is there free abdominal fluid, yes or no? And that could be answered at any site. However, it is important, Dr. Boysen, to realize that gravity is going to make fluid drop down. So you don't just apply a blind protocol here. You've got to think about if I'm really looking for fluid, maybe I'm going to start on those gravity dependent sites or at least move that probe, which we're going to talk about. So at all sites, is there free abdominal fluid? And also at all those other sites, Dr. Boysen, we can ask, is there free abdominal air? Yes or no. Again, air is going to rise. So a bit different in terms of where we're going to put the probe for the most sensitive sites. Absolutely, but it does change with patient position. So we need to think about all the different sites we can assess depending on all that patient's position. Then at each individual site, we can ask other individual questions. So at that urinary bladder site, we can ask the question, is our patient producing urine, yes or no? Or if it is a female and it is intact, not that common in North America, but if it is a female intact, we also worry about sepsis and potential pyometra. Zola is a male uh, neutered patient, so we don't have to worry so much about that in this situation. 100%, 100%, Dr. Boysen, at 2 2 paralumbar site, at the right one, we're going to be asking, is there generalized ileus when we're looking at the duodenum or duodenum, yes or no? We're not going to talk about that today. And is there renal pelvic dilation? We can look at both kidneys there. This is for cats, Dr. Boysen, potentially that ate lilies and that are azetemic. And we're just trying to determine if they're obstructed or if they have an obstruction or not in, in the case of lilies, yes or no. We're not going to talk about that today. And then your favorite sites. Yeah, the subzipoid, this has got the most information. And we realized this when we did the original FAST scan. We can see a lot at this location, including the heart and the uh, collar regions of the lung. But we're going to look for gallbladder wall edema, gastric ileus, or fluid distension and retention in the stomach. We're going to assess that collarina cava for potential fluid therapy. Can we give a bolus, yes or no? We'll look for pericardial fusion. As we look at that heart, we can also look at cardiac activity if we're doing CPR. When we're switching our compressors in that 10, five second window, we can quickly look for uh, cardiac activity. And we can also look for caudal lung pathology and pleural effusion at this site. So lots of things at that subzipoid site we can rapidly assess in a matter of seconds. 
100% Dr. Poison. And then back at the sub zygote side, is there evidence of a splenic mass? Yes or no? No literature on that in veterinary medicine yet, but I'm sure that's going to be coming. But one key thing, Dr. Boysen, it's important to combine the answers of abdominal point ultrasound findings with other POCUS results that we may or may not do, depending on the patient, history, and clinical findings to narrow the differential diagnoses. And again, this is done really quickly, Dr. Boysen. It's not the classic internal medicine problem that can might take me, what, a week or two or maybe a month to figure out. This is done immediately, Dr. Boysen. Yes, indeed. And then, therefore, it is patient-centered and targeted. You got to put what you're finding into context with the history and clinical findings. Absolutely. What order are you going to scan this patient in? Well, Dr. Boysen, I've seen you do this and other critical care emergency doctors. You often start a sub xiphoid, go down to the umbilicus, then the bladder, and then both paralumbars. It looks like you're crossing yourselves. And I don't know if that's you praying that your patient survives because you're in that domain of you know critical care. I, I don't know. Mine, mine tend to live very long. All right. So I will say, Dr. Shalhoub, that the reason you live is because you, you take months to find the diagnosis. They have to live because you don't know what's going on. It's going to take you a while to figure it out. But it, the, the point here is just like a physical exam, everybody thinks a little bit differently. Some people will actually do a rotational uh, evaluation clockwise or counterclockwise. What we like to do because they're the easiest organs to find often when our patients are in lateral or in standing, we do subzipoid umbilical and then urinary bladder. Once we've done that, we'll check the two kidneys afterwards. So it doesn't really make a difference the order as long as you are consistent and you have a systematic way of performing that so you don't overlook anything because we do want to make sure we assess questions and answer them thoroughly. 100% Dr. Boys. Now we talk about what patient position is scanning. We've already brought this up a little bit. What's important, Dr. Boys, is we want to keep our patient stable. So how do we ensure this? So we want to make sure that our patient has oxygen, for example, or we've given an anxiolytic to decrease work of breathing, make them as comfortable as possible. We'll stress that over and over again, scan the position the patient is most comfortable. And if our patient comes in with respiratory stress, that's definitely going to be standing or sternal with oxygen and anxiolytics. If our patient comes in in shock, like we saw with Zola, we're often performing this point of care ultrasound while we're otherwise implementing life-saving interventions like IV fluids or analgesics, et cetera. 100%. So patient position, they are most comfortable in. The key is to not make our patients less stable. We want to promote stability and also the happiness of our critical care specialist. Clearly, you're the only one I know, Dr. Boysen, that is very happy to do ultrasound in an unstable patient in an oxygen cage. Ah, I think there's a few others besides me. Just because you're internal medicine and run from the oxygen patient doesn't mean we're all scared. This is a patient that I'm happy to scan. All right, Dr. Boysen. Well, one key thing I think we both agree on is to avoid dorsal, Dr. Boysen, because we can make a potentially borderline stable or an unstable patient we don't know of potentially decompensate really quickly. Absolutely. So we avoid dorsal that are cardiovascular or respiratory unstable because they can decompensate. So let's come back to Zola then. We've got a summary here. This looks like a pretty busy slide, but we tried to summarize everything in terms of our initial uh, presentation, our initial differential diagnoses that we were most concerned about specific to Zola. And we're going to start with the abdomen. We may expand beyond that with our point of care evaluation, depending on how our patient's stable or how stable our patient is. But we're going to look at a number of different things. And free abdominal fluid, is that something I'm concerned about? Absolutely. With Zola, I'm worried about that uroabdomen, maybe a hemoabdomen. Free abdominal air, if I have a GI perforation, like we said, it's a red herring on the truck, then I do want to assess for free abdominal air. Maybe my patient's got anaphylaxis. Again, the history's not quite as classic for that, but I could see free abdominal fluid and I might see gallbladder changes if I have anaphylaxis, for example, so I'll look for that. What about the next four? Are those a high priority at this time as Zola presents or things that we might want to assess at a point in time once we know what's initially going on, how stable our patient is? Excellent question. Your production definitely should be on our minds. This patient is super azotemic, but again, not immediately, Dr. Boysen. We've got to worry about those other things first. Generalized ileus at this time, again, not going to be this patient's primary problem. Yeah, this patient was vomiting, but again, not really the primary problem here. Same thing with renal pelvic dilation, yes or no. If this was a cat, Dr. Boysen, oh yeah, I'd be worried about with that azotemia because that's more of a classic cat thing. And this dog, kind of not quite sure yet. And again, with the history of jumping down from that F-150 gastric ileus, kind of the same thing. 
Yeah, and then we're going to look at fluid bolus. That's another one that's highlighted in yellow because that's something we want to look at, that Cotylina cava. So we may not have time or we won't have time to go through that today, but that is something we definitely want to assess in Zola given that she's unstable. Can we give her fluid bolus? Yes or no? We can cover that in a different seminar at a different point in time. Pericardial fusion, we said we might have a red airing and maybe our patient's unstable because of pericardial fusion. So again, that's something that we can assess at the abdomen as well. That's on our list. And then what about the other ones there? Well, Dr. Poison, I don't do CPR because my patients live, so this is definitely more applicable to you. So I wouldn't know anything about this, Dr. Poison. So I would say, hopefully not, that we would have to worry about CPR here. Same thing, pleural effusion. Again, lung sounds were normal. Heart or respiratory rate was normal. Effort was normal. Not too worried about this right now. Maybe on a complementary exam. Um, call to lung pathology, kind of the same thing as well, Dr. Poison. And then splenic mass, if chemo abdomen, yes or no, again, this dog was normal before, now abnormal, not really suspecting a splenic mass immediately, Dr. Boys. And so I agree, as heavy the slide looks, we've really narrowed down the possibility for history, physical exam, and what we're going to do next, which is our point of care ultrasound. All right, so let's look at something simple that I believe even you would be comfortable looking for, Dr. Shalhoub, pre-abdominal fluid. Let's go through some of the nuances or things we should keep in mind there. Well, Dr. Boysen, if we go back and we look at abdominal point of care ultrasound compared to CT, which is the gold standard for finding fluid in the abdomen, the kappa is 0.82, which is an excellent agreement, Dr. Boysen, using the original yours 2004 abdominal fast protocol. So that is very important, Dr. Boysen, and that was using those that original protocol, which we have a beautiful diagram. I Did you draw that, Dr. Boysen? I got to say, that's Kind of a, a funny looking dog. Just wasn't sure if that was your art or, yeah. I believe my artistic talents could use some work, but they still far exceed yours. Next time we're making you draw the picture, Dr. Shalhoub. Uh, but it is a good point. It is excellent agreement when we compare it to the reference standard using the original protocol, two plane, short and long axis at those four sites. The agreement is even probably a little bit stronger if we include the umbilical site, which we now use as well. And we include serial examinations to look for fluid over time which was not done in this study by Walters. So still pretty good agreement though. Definitely something that will work for us to find free fluid. 100% Dr. Boysen. So question number one for Zola, is there free abdominal fluid? Yes or no? Before we move on, we got to talk about some important considerations, Dr. Boysen, because when it comes to fluid, fluid can actually accumulate anywhere. And that is very important. Before you put the probe on the dog, you got to know this. Absolutely. So that's why it is really a five point exam that you want to scan multiple sites because fluid might accumulate in different locations. We need to think about gravity dependent fluid accumulation, but there's other things that influence where fluid might be found. So we don't want to just do a quick flash, pop the probe on, hope we find something at one site, answer the question thoroughly. If you're looking for fluid, make sure you quickly, but thoroughly look at all sites to make sure you're comfortable. There really is no fluid there. 100%. And you didn't randomly choose these sites, Dr. Boys, and you consulted, did some research, these are the most sensitive sites for finding fluid. And then we got to think about how fluid accumulates a different location, patient position. Patient that is standing, fluid's going to drop ventrally. So we're going to want to put the probes ventrally, Dr. Boys. And same thing with a patient in lateral. You can't just put the probe perfectly perpendicular to that patient. You're going to fan those, those probes downwards to catch that fluid. It's important to think about how pathology is going to be affected by gravity. Absolutely. So we're still using the same five sites, but we're thinking about what pathology we're looking for and trying to maximize sensitivity. Don't push too hard if they're standing and you're coming in on midline. Make sure you fan down towards the gravity dependent regions if they're in lateral. Absolutely agree. And the other thing is fluid can be trapped by adhesions or momentum. So it's not always, although we look in the gravity dependent sites as most sensitive spot, but sometimes it is trapped in momentum or it has got adhesions. And therefore, again, we want to look at all five sites, but we also want to make sure we fan through those sites to increase our probability of finding that fluid. And this is why we also look at it in both long and short axis. If we're really worried and we really want to rule it out, we want to assess more than one plane and we want to scan through more than one orientation for sure. So 100%. patient position, pathology we're looking for, multiple sites, and think about fanning, rocking, and scanning through multiple planes when we're doing a thorough assessment for fluid. Yeah, and each binary question must be answered thoroughly, Dr. Boysen. We don't want to just put the probe on the patient and wish us good luck. you got to look at the most sensitive sites all together. Absolutely. And then let's go through these one at a time. Let's start with the subzipoid site then, Dr. Schlub. 
I pop the probe on uh, that subzipoid. I'm coming in at about a 45 degree angle, as you see here, when I'm going after that subzipoid, tucked right behind the subzipoid process. Make sure you go cranial. And I want to be able to see that diaphragm so I can see beyond the diaphragm when I'm assessing that subzipoid site. When we're looking for free fluid, we want to make sure, like we said, we fan through all planes from non gravity dependent through to the gravity dependent areas to look for that free fluid. And then we also want to, if we don't see it, make sure we assess the short axis. So we're scanning both planes to answer that question thoroughly. Once we look for free fluid, another nice thing that we can look for, gallbladder wall. So you can see the gallbladder is outlined here. That is very thin and white. So we're not seeing any thickening or edema in that gallbladder wall. Another easy thing for us to assess. We can then look at the columnina cava. You can see that down here bouncing where the green arrow is. We actually can see the far wall here. We can see the near wall here. We want to look for that cardiac pulse and we want to look for the change, the degree of change in that vena cava to walls with inspiration and expiration. And the other thing we look for really nicely is that pericardial fusion. You can see here, we've got a cardiac blend. We've got the heart blending with the diaphragm and the liver. And when we see that nice blend, no separation between those structures, we can essentially rule out pericardial fusion going around the heart at that site. And then again, like we do at all sites, like we said, we want to assess and get comfortable looking at long and short axis because we answer uh, and assess different things in long versus short axis planes, actually. I love that, Dr. Boysen. That is impressive. If we come back to Zola, Dr. Boysen, that question we wanted to ask, is there free abdominal fluid? We put the probe in that sub -xiphoid, and boom, what do we end up seeing here? We are in long axis. Whoa, Dr. Boysen, first of all, am I supposed to have fluid between the diaphragm and the liver? And not the second question, am I supposed to see individual liver lobes? No, that's a really good point. We should not see black separating the liver and the diaphragm. They tend to be continuous. And if you ever see individual liver lobes, that's a problem. We can either see individual liver lobes because we have infiltration in one lobe, or we can see the lobe separated by fluid like we have in this situation here. So that is abnormal. We are positive for free fluid. Let's move on then and ask the next question. Do we have free abdominal air? This one's a little more challenging because we're only looking at one site. So we're not gonna cover free abdominal air in today's session, but I would look for reverberation artifact coming off the peritoneal lining. So we're not gonna cover that here today. I don't see it obviously, but we should assess other sites, which we did do in Zola, and we did not have any free abdominal air. 100% Dr. Poison them. Do we have gallbladder wall edema, so called the halo sign, which can be secondary to fluid overload, pericardial effusion, sepsis, and also severe anaphylaxis, amongst other things. And then you see the gallbladder here, nice and thin wall, Dr. Poison. So binary question. No, we do not have gallbladder wall edema here. Absolutely. And now the next question that also we're not going to have time to cover today, that is going to be, can we give a fluid bolus? Yes or no. We can look at that caudal vena cava. Like we said, do we have at least a 25% change in the minimum and maximum width over the respiratory cycle? And do we see a cardiac pulse? So we're not going to assess that today again in the interest of time, but that is something thick in Zola that comes in unstable that we will normally assess for sure in our patients. 100%. And then if we look at the heart, Dr. Boys, in that left image on top, do we have pericardial effusion? The second you see that free ventricular wall blending in with the diaphragm there, you rule out clinically relevant pericardial effusion. Boom. Just like that, Dr. Boys, and easy peasy to do. We love this site and our patient Zola does not have pericardial effusion. All right. So excellent. So we're going to move on from that uh, subzipoid site then, and we're going to look at that uh, umbilical site. So we'll pop the probe on at the umbilicus. We'll take a quick look there and whoa, look at all that free fluid filling in sharp angles and triangles. So this is a large amount of fluid at that gravity dependent region. One of the sites that will often tap because there is actually a significant quantity of fluid there. Moving on from there, Dr. Shalhoub, what are we looking at? Well, now we're going to look at the urinary bladder site. So again, as you're moving down and doing your cross, as Dr. Boysen does, we are going to, this is very important. You got to lift that other leg to find the bladder. A lot of people don't do this. And boom, you see the bladder here in long axis. The marker is cranial. We've just outlined the bladder. Should be thin walled, but remember that an empty bladder can look thick. So that is very important. Now, when you're looking for fluid, you don't want to keep that probe just perpendicular. You got to think about how gravity affects it, Dr. Boys. And you want us to look at the apex of the bladder because that is a very, very, very sensitive site for finding fluid. We see the colon down there. We're fanning the probe, Dr. Boys, and looking downwards as well and upwards. Again, trying to maximize our chances of finding free abdominal fluid. That bladder is a wonderful site for that, Dr. Boys, and because bladder flu or fluid loves to accumulate at the apex and also different planes there. So again, we've just looked at everything there. We're going to rotate that probe into short axis. Again, this maximizes our chances of finding fluid. It's so easy to do, Dr. Boyden, just rotate that probe short axis. And it's going to be important when we get measurements of the bladder, which we're going to show shortly. 
Absolutely. So after we've assessed that urinary bladder site, we're now going to actually look at it in Zola. And here we go, Dr. Shalhoub. How are we looking? Well, Dr. Boysen, I see the bladder. Whoa! On top of that, look at those triangles of fluid that are forming there, Dr. Boysen. You and I love to call this the cat's claw, because it looks like a claw coming down, Dr. Boysen, because it forms uncontained angles out there. We can see the contained fluid in the bladder, but then we have those triangles of fluid, the cat's claw, whoosh, out there. Dr. I, I tend to call it something else. I don't tend to use the cat's claw, but that's okay if you want to call it that, Dr. Shalhoub. I'm fine oh. with that. I don't think I've ever called it that in my life, but that's okay. You go with what works for you. This has positive free fluid at the apex. Again, the part of the reason we look at that apex, we got some free fluid right at the apex of the bladder there. Following that, we're going to look at the right paralumbar site. So when we look at the right paralumbar site, the easiest way to find that, trace those ribs dorsally until you hit the sublumbar muscles, that retroperitoneal space. That's where the kidneys hide. Pop the probe on. You may need to jump between a rib like we did here, but there's our kidney and long axis. You can see it nicely here. We want to look for retroperitoneal and free abdominal fluid. We're going to fan all the way up one side of the kidney, fan all the way up the other side of the kidney. Make sure we don't have any free fluid there. Once we've done that in long axis, we turn into short axis. We're again going to fan off both poles of the kidney, looking for retroperitoneal or free fluid. And the other nice thing about when we're in short axis, in our cats, as Dr. Schlubin mentioned, we're not going to cover that today either, but this is where we look for renal pelvic dilation. So this is why it's really important to get comfortable scanning both long and short axis planes. One, to increase our chances of finding that fluid. And two, we are going to ask and answer some questions that require both planes, not just one. So that is our right paralumbar. Let's look at Lola then and see what we see here. There's our right paralumbar. What do you think, Dr. Shalhoub? Well, there's our kidney, Dr. Boysen, and I do see fluid around that kidney, Dr. Boysen. That is abnormal. So we are positive again here for fluid at this right paralumbar site. Ouch, Dr. Boysen, that's a lot of sites. Now let's go ahead and move on to the left paralumbar site. Again, here you're going to, the left kidney is lower. You're going to trace up that 13th rib. That's usually the place where you're going to find that left kidney and also the spleen. You go upwards, usually halfway up the abdomen. We're going to put a little bit of alcohol there, part the fur, put that probe in long axis right behind that 13th rib. Sometimes you have to go in between, but look at that. Boom. We also saw the spleen there. There's that kidney in long axis, just outlining there. And we are fanning until that organ disappears in both sides. There we go, fanning and fanning, and then we're gonna rotate the probe into short axis. Again, in cats, great way to see that um, renal pelvis, fanning and fanning, look at that. The liver's there too, that is the perfect left paralumbar site, and of course it is, because I'm the one scanning here, Dr. Boysen. All right, so you said liver and it's spleen, but okay, you're, oh, you're, spleen, again, you're sorry. tired. I so it is a lovely spleen that we get there on the left side. Uh, absolutely. So in our patient then, let's go ahead and look at that last fifth site. What do you think, Dr. Schlub? We are at the left paralumbar site. We can see the spleen here. The kidney's a bit caudal. We've moved forward. What do you think? I'm a little worried. Oh, I'm not even worried. I'm convinced, Dr. Boysen, that is all fluid there. Look at it forming triangles and all those nooks and crannies. That is not normal, Dr. Boysen. Dr. Boysen, we have fluid in every single site we have scanned for Zola. Now, you know what, Dr. Boysen, I'm pretty good at guessing things. I think I could just think, you know, put my hand on Zola and mm, I know exactly what kind of fluid is going is wrong with this dog. And I can walk away and put a diagnosis. If that is true, Dr. Shalhoub, then you are the only place person on the planet that can actually assess a patient's fluid type without actually analyzing it psychologically or chemically. So the nice thing about putting it sound, it localizes the problem of the abdomen when we see the fluid there, but it often lacks the specificity to tell us which organ is affected. So in this case here, we need to do synthesis. And when we do that synthesis, it's nice if we get a few basic things we can look at in hospital to tell us what might be going on. So my wife is a clinical pathologist. She would shoot me if I didn't put in a plug to say, if you see fluid and tap it, don't send it away and wait two weeks for the answers to come back. Do a little bit of in-house psychology. So we're going to perform abdominal synthesis, and we're going to look at that, Dr. Schlup. And the first thing we did was we spun it down, had a look at that uh, hematocrit. And you see on the left, peripheral from the blood, we got 49%, good number. On the right side, we're sitting at 12%, sort of that borderline, having presence of uh, a hematocrit there. But we also have a serosanguinous type fluid. The PCB is not as high as I would expect if it was an acute bleed. So why do we have this lower hematocrit in the abdomen, Dr. Schlup? Well, that's interesting, Dr. Boysen. So there is something going on here. Maybe there's a dilution effect. In other words, another type of fluid besides blood in there, Dr. Boysen. And we need to confirm if there is a urabdomen. How in the world would we do that? 
So if we suspect the abdomen, the history really fits in this one. We see the fluid, we see the diluted hematic right there. What we can do is we can actually assess the uh, potassium and creatinine ratio between the peripheral blood and the abdominal fluid. And when we do that, we can see that we can confirm. Lots of evidence out there, some more recent research that's come out as well. But you can see the values here that we had with Zola. She met these criteria for both potassium and creatinine. So we have a abdomen in this case, Dr. Schlu. How do you want to proceed with that? Well, Zola is unstable, Dr. Boysen. We got to stabilize Zola before we do anything else. And that's going to come to start with often IV fluids. Now, we brought up how we can use point of care ultrasound for this, Dr. Boysen. We can assess volume status, looking at that cauda vena cava. We can also look at heart chamber size, Dr. Boysen. And this is going to be key, especially for someone like me who loves IV fluids. My 1,000 mils per kg IV fluid boluses times three. I think this is going to be instrumental. All right, so we don't have time, unfortunately, to go through this, but yes, will we use point of care ultrasound to help us decide fluid therapy? We've got a problem in our patient, so we're going to get our baseline and monitor it. And once we've got our patient stable and we start doing some of that resuscitation, maybe as we're doing that and we know that we've got things under control, we can assess other things as needed. So we definitely can look at the lungs and the pore space, complete that more comprehensive systematic uh, evaluation, systemic evaluation with focus, but we do want to make sure our patients are stable and don't compromise our patient to do so. 100%, Dr. Boys. And now one key thing, we suspect the year abdomen. We need to confirm this. Really, the only way to do this is to do your urethrocystogram with contrast, Dr. Boys, because with ultrasound, you cannot confirm if there is a bladder rupture. The bladder will often be small, but sometimes it's not. So you really need to do a contrast study. And sure enough, we did see this in Zola. So, Dr. Boys, what is the prognosis for a dog like Zola? Well, it's interesting. Before we had uh, ultrasound, it took us a while to find these problems untreated, our patients have a mortality rate of 78%. But if we find the problem fairly quickly, like we did with Zola, our survival rate, if we do uh, surgical intervention or treatment is 73 to 79%. So we take something that's got a very poor prognosis, turn it into a very high success rate when we treat these patients for their urobin. So this works out really, really nicely. Good prognosis if we treat Zola appropriately. Well, wonderful, Dr. Boysen. So Zola did have a hemoabdomen. That's a big reason why she was unstable at that time, too. She did get a transfusion, but she also had that urabdomen. Less urgent immediately, but once she was more stable, she did go to surgery, and she did great, Dr. Boysen. Now, there is one little thing, though. She was hospitalized overnight. Absolutely. So we did actually have her in for a few days, uh, monitoring urine output, making sure that hematocrit stayed stable because it did fall after that initial bolus. Uh, we did increase the blood pressures a little bit. Uh, and you can see now uh, in Zola, we're sitting day three. We went to surgery. Everything looked good. We're nice and stable. Urinary catheter was removed on the anticipation that uh, Zola would be going home soon. But the overnight crew calls and they're concerned about urine production. They pull the urine catheter, the dog hasn't urinated, they're thinking maybe there's still a problem going on. Oh, can we do something to help us assess whether our patient's producing urine or not, Dr. Shalhoub? 100% you can, Dr. Boysen. You can actually estimate the urine bladder volume because that bladder, if you don't squish it too much like that image that we'd have up, is actually like a sphere. And you can actually calculate the volume of the sphere, which in this case, a couple studies have shown that will show you the urine volume in millimeters. It's an estimation. How do we do this? All right, so what we want to do is we want to uh, get as perpendicular as we can to the widest point of the urinary bladder in our transverse or short axis, sweep off to get smaller, larger, smaller, find that widest point, and we're going to actually take a measurement there as our width. And then we're going to turn the probe into long axis, Dr. Schlub, and what are we doing there? And then, Dr. Boysen, we're going to get the length. So we got the width and short axis. In long axis, we're going to get the length. And then in both short and long axis, we're going to get the height, Dr. Boysen, or the depth just to get an average divided by two. So we got width, length, depth, Dr. Boysen. We're going to multiply it by what? So this one here, we're going to multiply it by 0 0.52. It used to be 0 0.625, and there was a bit of work that was done uh, earlier in uh, JVEX, published at 0.625, but a more recent publication that came out in JVIM. Again, it probably depends a little bit on the size and shape of the urinary bladder, but in dogs, they found that 0 0.52 is a more accurate constant than 0.65 to get that answer in millimeters. Uh, and again, it's not 100% accurate. You can see it's not a perfect sphere, but over time, if we're measuring the same way, we can get a pretty good feel for producing urine or not. And although some people only measure one depth in either short or long, if you get it at the widest point and you're at the widest diameter in short axis and then do it again in long axis, these values should be very close to the same if you're truly at the widest point and you don't have your probe uh, oblique. So we like to average the two just to make sure that we do actually have the widest point in both axes. 
I love it, Dr. Bozen. So let's go ahead and summarize. Great news, team. Zola went home. So you got to consider the history and initial findings to determine which point of care ultrasound questions to ask first. Absolutely. Don't forget patient positioning will influence where sonographically defectable pathology accumulates. Air rises, fluid falls. We need to think about that and how our patients position, thinking about low stress, low handling, making sure we minimize that stress to the patient to scan them in the position the most comfortable, which will then influence where that pathology accumulates. Yeah. And ultrasound was in the earliest modalities to detect fluid, including neural abdomen. So great for a case just like Zola. Absolutely. Final analysis, though, when we're talking about your abdomen, we do want to make sure it is a euro abdomen. We need to confirm that by analyzing the fluid. So if we see the fluid, you can't tell what it is. Tap it. Do some in-house analysis like we did with Zola. It can definitely put you in the right direction. 100%. And then contrast studies are important if you want to help localize the specific urinary tract site of injury. Again, ultrasound would give you an idea, that fluid analysis, but then you got to do that contrast study to say that it's truly the bladder. And on that, Dr. Boysen, we are done. That is the end of our case today. And I think we're going to turn it over for some questions. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Shaloub and Boysen. Uh, please stay tuned for Q&A. We were going to do a quick demo here on we've got mountain here i confess i'm in a human emergency doctor so i know how to scan patients in the emergency setting but uh, the only time i really scanned animals is in our prior webinars but i watched you guys so i'm gonna just take a look here um you talked about the sub xiphoid talk me through if i'm doing anything wrong but i'm spreading the skin got the alcohol and uh all right here's the xiphoid let's see how we do what do you guys think that's amazing look at that that is actually the perfect yeah, right. xiphoid Great. There we go. So there's diaphragm there, right? Uh, liver. Yeah. And I'm going to fan. Gallbladder? Oh, gallbladder. 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 Look at that. Nice. And there's cardiac down here. Look at that. Heart field. Look at that. Yeah, That's nice. lovely. Okay. Uh, left ventricular Great. contraction there. Well done. And then you would do the uh, umbilical site here, right? So we do Absolutely. umbilical site. Yeah. Nice. Look at that spleen. All right. Yeah. Good job. Okay. Yep. And then the That's bladder, the urinary food. bladder. That's because I've got the nice sensitive touch. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Yeah. Okay. And then I could put some distant measurements on there if I wanted to, right? Yeah, uh, measure if I was going to measure bladder, do something like that. Nice. Maybe measure again. This one of your depths. Yeah. Yeah. It's your length. Right. Yeah. And that's an long axis. So you flip into short, yeah. you get one more uh, depth and you're, or, or width and you're good to go. One yeah. More width, width and there you go. Yeah. yeah. And you do the width on that and you'll have the three that you okay. need. And you can see the colon down below. Boom. Yeah. Call that in a guesstimate, right? Yeah, that's yeah, good. That's, the, um, that's good. There's, it was up here, right? So this is the one I've done. I've done this one in another webinar. So I'm kind of cheating now. <laughs> uh, feel the edge of the ribs, kind of right on the sublumbars. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's oh, the left side. There's, 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 right. there's, there's, right. there's your favorite. I nice. love it. Got it. it. Made me so proud. It. It made me very proud. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay. Nice Great. job. I'm feeling pretty confident. Yeah. All right. And then the other one. Yeah, Let it roll, roll up and down. Over. I'm that standing one. with yeah, it. Yeah. Standing. Yeah. I feel a little tricky. And the right, right side is tougher. It's, uh, you we have faith in you. The rib a little bit. Okay. Nice. I appreciate your faith. Oh, that was the duodenum. Great job. There's the kidney coming in. Yeah. There you go. You got it. There it is. Boom. There. Nice. Nicely Boom. done. Look at that. Right in that battle renal fossil. Look at that liver sitting just cranium. Five point. Too. So five point A fast. And what'd that take me? Two minutes. I'm a novice, total novice. Nicely done. <laughs> Not bad. Yeah. All right. Very impressive. Well, want to make sure, please, um, we're probably going to go over the time here, but uh, please use the Q&A at the bottom. And uh, I admit you're putting all your questions. I'm going to hand it back to Janez to take us home, and then we will get to Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Frankel, and thank you, Drs. Boyson and Chaloub. We'll begin our Q&A session in a moment. You do need to stay on for the webinar for 15 minutes or plus to be able to qualify for CE, CPD credit. So please do stay with us. It's going to be a lively Q&A session. And again, uh, if you need that extra time, we have it today uh, to qualify if you joined us late. Uh, before we go to our live Q&A session, we do have a question for you. This poll is an opportunity to learn more about our Clarius third generation Clarius wireless ultrasound scanners for your veterinary practice, which are now available in dozens of regions around the world. Um, and so please go ahead and select any of these options that make sense for you. Pricing and availability does vary by region, so please feel free to request a quote and pricing. We'll be happy to 
get that information to you. You may opt to speak to one of our experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound for your veterinary practice. If you'd like to discuss scanner features, please select that option. You can also book a virtual one-on-one -on -one demo with our experts to see the new Claire's HD3 in action. And we can send you more video tutorials for veterinary medicine. Um, and so please go ahead and select that option if you'd like some video tutorials. Um, while you complete the poll, I'll take a minute to tell you about our newly released Claris HD3 version of our Claris Vet Scanners for the highest definition wireless ultrasound imaging to speed diagnosis for small, medium, and large animals. Our C7 HD3 micro convex vet scanner, which you saw in action today, is specifically designed for clear clinical imaging for small and medium animals like cats and dogs. We also have the C3 micro convex for larger animals like sheep and horses, and the L7 linear vet for superior um, MSK imaging, often used in equine applications. Now, 30% smaller, lighter, and more affordable, and with an enclosed battery, our third generation family of vet scanners are available in select regions and deliver several advantages. Claris HE3 is unrivaled for high resolution imaging and handheld ultrasound with dedicated animal presets. Claris shows you the fine details you need to investigate an area of concern, perform a fast exam, and make a confident diagnosis on your patient's first visit to expedite the right treatment plan. Each scanner is designed with eight beam formers and 192 elements that deliver the image quality and speed only found in traditional systems, but at a fraction of the cost. Artificial intelligence replaces complex knobs and buttons, making our scanners fast and easy to learn and use. Claris is also wireless with zero footprint for high portability to scan animals where they are in the position they're most comfortable in, from the vet clinic to their homes. You get free movement with no more wires getting in the way or startling the animals, also making it so much faster to clean and disinfect. Only Claris delivers wireless scanners with an ecosystem that includes a free app for your iOS or Android devices with free updates. Available with our new membership, Claris Cloud is available to capture and manage unlimited exams from anywhere. Your membership includes in-app Claris classroom videos with experts like Dr. Shaloub and Boyson, as well as onboarding with Claris clinicians to bring your ultrasound scanning skills to the next level. And Claris Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for a second opinion. There's a new advanced veterinary package that offers more flexibility for users who need additional or advanced workflows for various animal examinations, for example, with access to finely tuned presets categorized by application and anatomy. For clinicians who prefer one-time purchase over membership, the Claris advanced veterinary package is available as an add-on purchase. With increased ultrasound billings, you'll see a rapid return on your Claris HD3 vet scanner, which is ultra affordable. We'll now give you three more seconds and close out the pool to allow you to request more information. Two, one. Thank you for participating. We will get back to you in the coming week. We do have one final poll prior to our Q&A session. We'd like to invite you to pre-register for our next veterinary webinar. Please click yes in the poll to save your seat for our September 27th webinar, Practical Small Animal Ultrasound Guided Fine Needle Aspiration Techniques. Veterinary, veterinary ultrasound educator, Dr. Camilla Edwards, will show us how to perform fine needle aspirations of abdominal organs safely using ultrasound guidance. She'll help us hone our image interpretation skills to recognize structures that we need to avoid to find the best and safest path for fine needle aspirate. I'll give you five more seconds to save your seat. Four, three, two, one. Okay, now let's begin our live Q&A session. Please use the Q&A icon in the menu bar to ask your questions for Drs. Boyson and Shaloub. Because this is a common question, I do want to let everyone know that we are recording today's session and a link will be made available um, for viewing. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Frankel to moderate our Q&A session. Great, yeah, thanks everybody for sticking around and uh, we'll try and get through as many questions as possible in the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, the first question, I'm going to combine several together. Um, folks want to know what kind of uh, anxiety, anxiolysis medication do you use um, in the sick and traumatically injured or critically ill patients? So we tend to use bitorphanol uh, just because it's very safe. And um, in terms of dosage, we use anything from 0.2 to 0.4 mg per kg. It works great because, again, it's not going to overly sedate that patient. And again, when you're not quite sure what's going on with that patient, it really can reduce that anxiety just enough for you to be able to do whatever you need to do, which is your exam, point of care ultrasound, potentially place a catheter. Dr. Boysen, what do you think? 
So I would agree if our patients are looking uh, anxious and we're just thinking anxiolytic, then butorphanol is one of the ones I often reach for as a starting point. So those cats that come in with congestive heart failure, they're anxious. Uh, however, if my patient's also got concurrent pain or discomfort, then we're not going to give them the butorphanol because it doesn't provide analgesia. It just provides that uh, anxiolytic component. So I don't tend to use butorphanol if they're painful. If I need something that's going to treat both pain and anxiety, then I'm going to go with more of a uh, pure opioid in that situation to try and uh, achieve both with one uh, uh, treatment. Great. Um, another combination of several questions, somewhat reviewed in the webinar, but maybe you could expand a little more on in terms of um, where do you uh, decide to diagnose, say, hemo, uh, hemopericardium or uh, hemoabdomen versus uroabdomen? Uh, and so where do you get the sample and how do you actually proceed in doing that? So an excellent question. And the big thing to keep in mind, and the reason that we decided or came to the conclusion that we had a hemo uroabdomen in uh, Zola is the fact that if we've got an acute bleed, then we should have a pack cell volume that's going to be very similar to our peripheral blood. And therefore, I would expect that even with a day or so, we'd see some absorption, but I'd expect to see a, a fairly close uh, pack cell volume to the peripheral blood. When we're sitting at uh, straight uroabdomen, then I expect that hematic rate to be extremely low. So I would expect it to be less than 3%, for example. Then we're going to call it a serosanguinous uh, fluid. When we've got 12% and a large quantity of fluid in the abdomen, like we saw with Zola, then again, you got to think about the amount of fluid that's there, that 12% hematocrit is going to be extremely diluted by whatever's there. So there is a component of bleeding there, and the actual hematocrit would have been higher if we hadn't had the urine in there. So we got to consider that that is a diluted red cell count to sit at 12%. It's too high to be serosanguinous and uh, it's uh, too low to be a straight bleed, which is why we come to the suspicion that it's a hemo-uroabdomen. Once we resuscitated in Zola because of the degree of dehydration, we could see that that pack volume fell quite significantly. Then knowing that we're going to surgery, uh, that's why we gave that transfusion at the point in time we did. But it's a very good question uh, on where you call, draw the line between a serosanguinous and a hemorrhagic effusion. Uh, it varies a little bit in the literature, but we're usually sitting around uh, values less than 10% for serosanguinous. And in this case, 12% with that other fluid that was there and that quantity, uh, then we know that we probably also got some hemorrhage that's being uh, underestimated by the degree of dilution that's there. And you're always doing the tap in the umbilical area? So it's a good question. And when we do our uh, abdominal synthesis, we've got ultrasound. So we look for the biggest pocket. Most often that is going to be in that umbilical region or in that gravity dependent region where the fluid's in its greatest quantity. But in all honesty, we've got ultrasound. I look for the pocket that's largest that has the least vital structures around it and then use ultrasound to either assist by removing the ultrasound and tapping that pocket that was largest or do it as actual ultrasound guided. It's a small pocket and I want to make sure I get that sample and don't get a contamination with other structures. Then I'm actually using the ultrasound to walk the needle tip into that pocket, make sure it is that pocket that I sample. And then I've got confidence in that. So I will say it varies depending on where the pocket is, largest pocket and other structures around that pocket of fluid. A lot of folks want to know how they can both get better hands-on skills to learn how to do ultrasound uh, as well as you guys do it. And then also how to interpret images once they do find them. Well, practice, practice, practice is very important. I think some of the, you know, again, there are studies showing that, you know, anyone can pick up um, an ultrasound and learn point of care ultrasound, right? And with practice, you get better and better and your skills improve. So obviously to start out, sometimes taking a, a class is very important, you know, and most of the major conferences in North America offer point of care ultrasound labs. Um, for us, for instance, uh, we're going to be a Western vet in Las Vegas. We're, um, uh, we just did the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association. We're going to be in Alberta doing the Ken West, so et cetera, et cetera. So they're pretty common labs. So I think that's always a good starting point. And then it's a matter of practice. Um, Dr. Boysen loves this. It's like, you know what? If you do space, uh, you're going to be doing an abdominal procedure on an animal. You could do point of care ultrasound on that patient after there is going to be a little bit of residual fluid in that abdomen. You can go find it. Um, and sometimes even airs, so you can practice pneumoperitoneum there too. Um, when it comes to the heart, it's really about practice, practice, look at normals, 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 so that when you see something abnormal, then you can you can find it. So again, really quick skills to pick up, but it does take practice. And yeah, starting with a class to begin with is probably going to be important class and practical lab.
And if you want interpretation, uh, again, Serge and I, we have our emails uh, included here. Uh, we love looking at point of care ultrasound clips. So if you have some uncertainty or you want some feedback on a potential image that you obtain, you're more than, uh, again, it may take us a little while depending on where we are and how busy we are, uh, if we're on clinics or not, but we are more than happy to try and provide feedback on the assessment of any clips that you have. Or if you uh, are really keen, there is uh, the European Emergency Critical Care Point of Care Ultrasound Society, where people share their clips to get feedback from roughly 1,500 veterinarians in Europe. Uh, so you can also join the uh, European Emergency Critical Care Club if you want, Point of Care Ultrasound Club, if you want to get the uh, feedback on some of your images in terms of their quality or what they might represent. But Serge and I are always happy to take those um, clips as well and interpret them for you. Awesome. Uh, one question was around retroperitoneal fluid. What do you look for? Because uh, we looked at ab intra-abdominal fluid in this webinar. What are some signs of retroperitoneal findings, uh, and what would they? Yeah, what would they signify? All right. So uh, I don't know, Thursday kidneys, yours. I don't know if you want to jump Go in or. <laughs> All right. So often what we're looking for when we see that retroperitoneal is it will form a, a rim or a small um, line around the kidney that will start to outline it. So often when we see that retroperitoneal around the kidney, it actually tends to stick to and be surrounding that kidney. It's almost uh, a little bit looking like for pericardial fusion around the heart. You'll look for it surrounding the kidney itself. And the neat thing about that is, is when you turn your patient into a standing position or into a position where that kidney becomes non-gravity dependent, we tend to still see that fluid in that area around the retroperitoneal piece around the kidney. Whereas if it's abdominal fluid, it tends to be less contained. It tends to form more sharp angles or triangles. And we can often move that fluid with patient positioning when it's in the abdomen. So we'll often uh, change patient position slightly to see if it changes things and then look to see if it's truly contained within that region around the kidney. When it starts to really fill the retroperitoneal space, then it gets more complicated and more challenging uh, for sure. Great. Um, I think uh, people really want to know more about um, analyzing the fluid, like after you tapped it. Uh, do you, is this like run on your normal biochemical machine? Um, or are there any other tricks of the trade that you can share maybe on how to analyze the fluid in the lab or in the, in the clinic? Great question, and it depends on how expensive your in-house machine is and if you have cartridges for your machine or not. Uh, one of the ways that we tend to run it so that we're not going to damage the larger laboratory machines that we have is on the iStat. So we do have the iStat that is a very uh, portable. It has the cartridges, so we put the fluid in the cartridge and it reads it nicely uh, so we don't have to worry about damaging the actual um, chemistry machine. We used to have, or we did when I was a resident, we had the uh, the Nova Biomedical, and uh, that's not one you want to run the urine through because the techs get very, very angry at you when you clog up the machine and it's not blood you're putting in there. So you do need to check to see what you have in-house, and most of the cartridges will allow you to look for these uh, urea and creatinine and do your comparisons to purple blood without messing things up when they're cartridges. If you've got a larger machine that runs the sample and draws it in, then just make sure you check with your uh, manufacturer that you're able to do that analysis on non-blood uh, gradated products. Great. Uh, and then I think the final question, um, grouping together a few again, is uh, bladder measurement. How often are you doing that? Um, and where do you find the greatest utility? Well, for instance, for me, um, when it comes to cats that come in, they're azotemic, and I've corrected their dehydration, and I'm trying to determine if they're making urine. And they may not be the most ideal patients, especially a female cat, to place a urinary catheter. So I'm going to be tracking that bladder, that volume, using ultrasound because it's going to be much less invasive. And also, initially, when um, I do work emergency, CERN loves to make fun of me, but I do sometimes look at him as an emergency doctor. And um, sometimes it's extremely practical. I'm going to go look at that cotavine came in that heart, determine that patient definitely can take a fluid bolus. And I'm going to bolus that patient and check again and make sure that that patient tolerated that fluid bolus well and to even see if there's more room. So um, we're going to do that there. But also at the bladder, I want to see if they made urine, right? That's all something else. It's like, oh, wait a minute. Okay, now they're making urine. They're making urine. If they're not making urine, I might be a little worried about that. So again, it's, it's a holistic approach. Um, but I use that bladder measurement both in the hospitalized patients, but also sometimes in that patient I've just admitted, trying to determine are they making urine, yes or no, especially if they're azotemic. Great. 
Well, I want to be respectful of people's time. Thanks so much, guys. Um, there are some questions we didn't get to, and we will uh, be following up with those in the coming days. I'll hand it over back to Janice to take it home. Absolutely, yes. Thank you for staying for our bonus Q&A session. We will get back to you in the coming week uh, via email uh, if we didn't get to your question. Again, you'll all receive a copy of the webinar recording by email in the coming week. Please do complete our, our closing survey to give us your feedback so we can continue to bring great educational content like today's. I'd like to conclude by thanking Drs. Boyson and Dr. Shaloub. Thank you to all of us for joining us here today. I hope you had as much fun as we did. We hope to see you all again on September 27th for our veterinary webinar on ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration with Dr. Camilla Edwards. In the meantime, keep scanning and thanks again for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.